So hello everyone, welcome to another hackathon. This one organized by uh, Simplex and Pibs and Apart uh, all together as a big collab. Um, today we have uh, Dr. Paul Rikers uh, and Adam Shai, doctor, professor, um, or just just Adam. Um, they will be uh, kind of starting off this uh, keynote with uh, presentations, uh, but we will also have ample time at the end for questions and answers. Um, as a reminder, uh, at the bottom, all of you should have a Q&A uh, button. Uh, please ask your questions there. If you want to ask your question live through audio, you can also raise hand. Um, the speakers will see that uh, and they can uh, unmute you. Um, is there any other housekeeping I want to do? No, I think uh, that is pretty much it. Do remember that once this keynote is done, uh, there is a bit of a break and then there is another session on Discord um, where people can pair up into teams. Uh, I think Adam will be facilitating uh, kind of like people to, to uh, group up on Discord. Um, yeah, that is it. Uh, good light hacking for the next uh, two, three days. Um, and yeah, excited to see what you all come up with. Uh, take it away, Adam. Thanks. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, we're super excited to uh, participate in this hackathon. Uh, hopefully, everyone learns a lot and gets some research done. Um, so what's going to happen now is that Paul is going to give a little bit of an introduction to CompMec and go through some of our results. And then I'm going to talk about um, the code base that's available to, to everyone here and some kind of ideas for projects. There won't be all the possible projects. Obviously, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, I think, a lot of progress to be made, but just some inspiration. Um, so I guess I'll just say, just to start off, that like, to my mind, the reason why I'm so excited about computation mechanics for work and interpretability and AI safety more generally is that computational mechanics really kind of gives a, a very principled definition of structure that can be applied both to training data, neural network behavior, and kind of the internal computation that goes um, on in neural networks. And um, I'll, I'll hand it off to Paul right now, who will make that a lot more concrete. Um, so I'll take it away. All right, cool. Thanks, Adam. And yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Um, really happy to um, be part of the excitement around CompMec because uh, um, you know I've been, involved with computational mechanics for a long time. Um, and it's been kind of a, a small community with really cool results. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's neat and gratifying to be part of um, it being useful for uh, interpreting something so central to uh, society. And um, I feel a bit like we have uh, a responsibility. It's like, uh, an exciting time, but also a bit of a responsibility to see what we can get out of this uh, new way of um, looking at models. So uh, let me get here to... Okay, cool, so you guys can see my slides, all right. Um, so I imagine if you're if you're here, you've, uh, you either know of or have at least heard a little bit about computational mechanics, um, but I'll just give a little bit um, more background that um, basically computational mechanics has it has a rich history, um, which I'm not going to you know go through all of it, but um, it's basically grown out of uh, chaos theory and uh, parts of physics, which um, you know the the reason is we're trying to figure out um, in physics uh, how to create models to predict the future from the past. And, and then it turns out you had these chaotic systems that had limitations apparently on what you could predict. So there's like really a need to understand um, how fundamental this was. So computational mechanics grew out of these ideas of chaos theory, information theory, uh, symbolic dynamics and so on. Um, and has really compiled a lot of ideas over, over decades really. Um, and I'd say is still maturing. So there's, um, Kind of theory to leverage and also theory to adapt and develop. Um, but I'd say also, even though it has roots in physics, uh, the theory is really uh, general and that it's just about 
what is it like to predict the future as well as possible from the past? And uh, so for that reason, it's had applications you know, far outside of physics and now, uh, now in AI because, well, we're training models to predict future tokens from past tokens as well as possible, right? So, um, I mean, I guess that takes me to a bit of a motivational question on, um, on the AI side. So I have a question for you. You know, what can you learn from next token prediction? So you think for a second about if you have some intuition about this. You know, there's there's various intuitions uh, floating around. And you know, there's even some maybe popular idea that, hey, maybe next token prediction is sufficient to learn an entire model of the world. So there's there's some intuitions like this. Um, you know, but it hasn't really been formal, and for that reason, there's been disagreement in uh, in the intuition. But the point is, we actually can formalize and answer this question of what you learn if you do as well as possible at next token prediction. Um, and so that's really where the framework of computational mechanics comes in. And so I guess before I get into the general theory, maybe we'll just motivate this with. Uh, with an example. So let's say that uh, the data you're training on is, um, is this three-state hidden Markov model. Uh, if you've seen our uh, recent work, you might have seen this example. And so uh, as a hidden Markov model, if you're observing the data, you just see these A's, B's, and C's. You don't actually directly see the states, right? Um, you just see the, um, the, the data that you can think of it being generated um, in the transitions between these hidden states. And so then the question is, okay, if you were um, observing the data, either as a human or, or as an AI, um, you know, as machine learning task, what, what would you learn if you were training on uh, next token prediction? Well, if this kind of intuition is correct that you could um, learn a world model, then you might think, well, this thing has three states, so I should learn maybe something about three states. Maybe I learned some transition probabilities. But then when we actually work through the theory, if we take this question seriously, we say, well, actually, it's not quite that. It's, it's more than that. In fact, we anticipate this kind of crazy fractal structure. And well, how is that? Um, well, first of all, um, it's important to recognize that we're training models to predict rather than to generate. And the task of prediction is much more complicated than just generation. In fact, to predict as well as possible, you uh, basically, yes, you do need a model of the world, but you also need, even if you have a model of the world, uh, you can imagine, uh, you know, as, as humans, we have models of the world, we, we walk around in it, we go to bed, we wake up, even though we have a model of the world, we're not synchronized to its current state because uh, we have these impoverished observables the way that uh, the, the output of this model or any particular word or token in English depends on its context and what's come before. So, um, so the point is that since we're teaching models to predict, uh, they must essentially also have something like some Bayesian inference updating uh, to synchronize to the hidden state of the world. And so, so there's this okay vague thing in terms of different histories will appoint these different belief states, different distributions over the future, and and then we're saying okay, actually somehow this this geometry, uh, there's there's these belief states, and then there's even an embedding, a geometric embedding of these belief states, and somehow something about that should be in the residual stream. So, to test this, we just we train a small transformer on this data, and what we find is kind of amazingly convenient, didn't actually expect it to turn out this well, that uh, exactly this um, geometric structure is represented linearly uh, in the residual stream. So uh, yeah, kind of wild, very encouraging, um, gratifying, but also then opens up um, both a lot of questions and opportunities for us. Right? And so, so hopefully that motivates uh, you know a little bit more getting into the theory. And I'll say that um, 
you know, as I step through some things, feel free to interrupt me, especially if uh, it's clarifications of like notation or something, because there's no point of um, being left behind on this. Um, but the, so, so how do we actually go from, uh, you know, some, some idea of a generative model to, to making this prediction? Well, uh, it's helpful to think about a series of tokens as a sequence of correlated random variables. And you know when we when we try on this perspective, then we can pull in probability distributions, information theory, and it's really useful to recognize that well, in fact, we basically borrow a theorem, it was corollary two from some paper from two thousand one, that if you have some hidden state that you're basing your predictions on, if that hidden state is sufficient for a next token prediction then it must also be a sufficient statistic to predict the entire future as well as possible. Um, so this basically comes down to the answer of what can next token prediction do? Um, if you minimize loss on next token prediction, you're actually going to be able to predict the entire future as well as possible. So you're not only gonna nail that next token distribution, you're gonna nail the distribution for everything, right? So, so now we're talking about dynamics in kind of a different space. There's uh, there's dynamics that the model's producing as it hops between states, but uh, we have this meta dynamic now over uh, distributions, probability distributions over the future. And as you move through context, as you observe longer words, how does that probability distribution change? And I'm just checking, looks like there's comments here. Um, right, so there's a nomenclature question on the kind of left arrow and right arrow over the X's. So uh, this is just kind of a shorthand for, um, I assume you can see my cursor here. So um, this is going to be this conditional probability of the probability of the next uh, random variable for the next token, uh, given some uh, particular history. So, so the left, over, left arrow is implying history, whereas the right arrow is implying future. Um, capital letters are random variables, whereas uh, lowercase letters are instantiations of those random variables. So hopefully that clarifies a bit. Um, and here R is this uh, hidden variable. So it's just like in this very general context. Here it happens to be basically the entire residual stream um, is the way we would adapt this theory to be relevant here. Um, and this is to say that um, if the hidden state, basically the, the whole residual stream, is a function of the past hidden state and the next token produced, um, such that it is a sufficient statistic uh, for the next token prediction, then it also must be a sufficient statistic for predicting the entire future. So hopefully that's more clear. All right, so um, right, so now we're talking about this this meta dynamic of um, how do how do these probability densities over the future shift as you look at more context, and that's really where kind of this fractal result result and the more general idea of uh, meta dynamics comes in, uh, where we're going to see the geometry. So I'll give another example of that. Um, so here is a relatively straightforward example that. Um, it's a zero one random process. So it's cyclic in a sense, but there's gonna be kind of randomness on the um, every third time step you'd think, but you don't really know when you, when you start looking at the process, you don't really know the phase or anything. Um, but again, even if you knew this process as well as possible, but you just started observing, you don't know what state that you start in. Uh, now, every distribution over this model, if you can think of any probability distribution over the states of this generative model, uh, that implies a probability density over the entire future, right? Because it's it gives probabilities to anything you could imagine. And so this metadynamics over futures, you can think about it also as a metadynamic over these belief states over the distributions over the generator states. Um, and we have these, these T0 and T1 matrices where zero and one, those are, you know, that's the finite alphabet you see here. You see sequences of zeros and ones. 
And so these labeled transition matrices are substochastic. When you sum them together, they give the net stochastic transition matrix. And but these but these labeled transition matrices basically tell us how to do Bayesian updating. So uh, you know even if we know this process, but we don't know we haven't observed anything yet, and you start observing. So you see a you see a zero. You could either be in the um, S zero or S one state. So then you basically apply a Bayes rule according to these transition matrices, and you move from your initial, uh, say, stationary distribution over these states, and uh, you would move to some new distribution. And in this case, eventually you would uh, synchronize to, to one of these generative states. So you, so you have this kind of discrete state structure between uh, in the bottom middle in terms of how you move between belief states. But then there's this key step uh, that also there's an implied geometry uh, of how these belief states are embedded and what's going on here. You can think about they're embedded in the probability simplex over the states of the generative model, right? So, so okay, this is this is empowering then. Uh, we have some idea of how beliefs are updated. How do we how do we actually find this in the residual stream? So um, you all are probably familiar with uh, transformer architecture. Um, the idea is the residual streams, the specter space, just going through the all the layers of the model. And different histories will induce different activations, different points in that vector space. And we look for uh, all the different histories, what you know, what points, what are the activations throughout the residual stream? Uh, in general, we could concatenate those and just kind of on the belief that that mixed state presentation, that geometry of the belief states should be there. Um, we look for a uh, linear map that would uh, project all those points onto hopefully uh, something that looks like um, our simplex. All right, so it's just a linear regression here and uh, see what we get moving from the activations to, uh, at least in the toy examples, the ground truth. There's a bit of an open question of how we would find this simplex otherwise, maybe good hack on the project. Okay, so here's so here's another fun example on the bottom. Um, there's this random random XOR process. Um, the name is you know quite uh, prosaic that you can imagine that you have a coin, uh, you flip it. So there's a random outcome, you have another coin, you flip it. And then on the third time step, you just take the exclusive or operation of the last two. Right, so then you have this kind of generative structure for how that works out. Uh, this process is pretty interesting, it has zero pairwise correlation like whatsoever, um, but it does have higher order correlation. And the uh, and there's 36 unique belief states that you could have about this as you as you observe um, more context. So this because there's a five state minimal generative model, there's a four simplex, so some four dimensional object where the probabilities live but we can just project it down to two dimensions to look at it, it has this nice symmetry. And then again, we do the same thing. We look in the, in the residual stream and we say, well, is, is this thing there? Are the belief states really there? And, and indeed we find um, very well that they are. And a point that I'd like to really make here is that these different belief states, many of these different belief states have exactly the same next token probability distribution. So uh, I think that's important because you, again, you might think because it's trained on next token probability, if the probability distribution for the next token is the same, the model wouldn't distinguish that. But in fact, what we're seeing here is that the model, the transformer does choose to distinguish states if they have different probability distributions over the far future, even if the next token distribution is the same. Uh, so I think that's quite a key prediction of our framework, which is borne out in experiments. So. Um, I think I'll go uh, on to this next part of the theory. I don't want to kind of belabor things for too long, but uh, but maybe give just a little bit more background and uh, you should all feel feel welcome to ask questions to, to guide things later as you. So, so the key lesson, if nothing else to take away from this, is that um, predicting the future requires not only a model of the world, but also a way to synchronize to its hidden state. And Again, we 
think of the sequence of tokens as a sequence of random variables. And then you can ask very basic questions uh, that you can quantify though. Uh, like how random is this process, right? You can be thinking about natural language or whatever you might want the process to be. Very basic questions. How random is it? How intrinsically random is it? How predictable is it? Maybe you'd think these are the same question. These are actually different questions, how random and how predictable it is. And then how do you actually do the prediction? So, so let's start with the first one. How random is uh, my correlated sequence of random variables? So, well, we quantify randomness information content with Shannon entropy typically, right? That uh, we have our minus sum of P log P and that quantifies um, how much memory is required for a random variable. Okay, but we're not just talking about one random variable, we're talking about this joint random variable. And so you can consider the joint entropy or you can consider conditional entropies. And the thing that matters uh, here, we wanna know as you've considered some amount of context of length L, uh, you've considered L tokens, what is the entropy of the next token given the last L that you've seen? So, so we have these kind of bubble Venn diagram things, which are sometimes useful for giving intuition for this. And uh, so, so we can quantify this as the, we call it the myopic entropy rate. It's just the token of the next, the, the entropy of the next token given some uh, past of length L, All right? Okay, so that's basically the answer to how random uh, the process is. And you can consider that as you observe more history uh, that will typically decay. And if it's a stationary stochastic process, it'll decay and asymptote to some, uh, Shannon entropy rate. Um, okay, so that's how random, how predictable is it? So like I suggest, that's a different question. How much can you predict about the future given the past? It's not just the, it's not just the lack of randomness. Um, so the, the overlap with the past and future, you can quantify it with the mutual information. Um, and if you're reading some comp mech stuff, you might see this as the excess entropy as you take the limit of large, uh, long histories. And then, well, how much information is required? How much information about the past do you need to store to predict the future as well as possible? And it's tempting to say, well, that's how much I need the overlap. Um, so this is kind of a uh, interesting prediction of computational mechanics that actually you're going to need more than that amount of information generically. You need to hold on to more about the past than its overlap with the future to do prediction. Um, and so, okay, that's uh, perhaps non-intuitive, but um, a result of computational mechanics. And kind of an interesting side note that depends of whether you're predicting in forward time or reverse time, but we don't need to get lost in the weeds. So, Okay, how I've just quantified some things. I gave a number, but we want something more structural, right? And we've already kind of seen this with the belief state metadynamic, this mixed state presentation, but let's visit this a little more carefully. How do we actually do the prediction? So if you just think about, well, I just need to hang on to my history. Well, if you think about all the different histories you could be storing, there's exponentially many. You know, as you go back in time, uh, there's an explosion of possibilities. Uh, and then you need what, like a lookup map for every possible one, that's not gonna be practical. So somehow you need to compress histories to be able to predict the future. A model is gonna somehow have to say, what are the features of the past that matter for predicting the future as well as possible? Well, so there's a mantra, actually, it's, it's a little simple in hindsight, but just don't distinguish pasts that don't distinguish themselves for the purpose of prediction. Okay, well, what happens if we take this seriously uh, you could formalize that in terms of a uh, equivalence relation. Uh, so this thing has maybe the bad name of causal equivalence relation that two histories, uh, X and X prime, are uh, equivalent for the purpose of prediction if they induce the same probability density over futures. And if I considered a finite length future, then it would be a prob the same probability distribution over those futures, right? So, so there's two different ways of thinking of these equivalence classes. You can think of it as collections of histories. Uh, you could also think about it as just really about the, the distribution itself, the, uh, the conditional distribution over futures. It's useful to think about it both ways. 
okay, so we have the static thing, we have those belief states, but there is the dynamic thing. Like when, you know, you see the beautiful fractal picture, you're just seeing the static thing. You're seeing the different belief states, but there's also the meta dynamic among them. So you have this transition dynamic among these belief states. And uh, there's this property called unifolarity. Again, if you're looking at computational mechanics papers, you might see this. It basically means that there's deterministic transitions between belief states in the sense that if you're in belief state S and you saw a new symbol X, there's there's an answer to how to do Bayesian updating. So you would you would move to the new belief state S prime. So um, so the uh, belief state metadynamic is deterministic in that sense, even though the the actual outcome X is uh, probabilistic. So okay, so I've claimed that prediction is harder than generation. So let's look at some examples. Um, let's say you have a biased coin. It's just like a Bernoulli process. You have zeros and ones with different probabilities. How do you predict it? Well, according to what I said, you look for the uh, equivalence classes of histories. And actually in the case of a coin, it's an IID process. Any IID process, there's nothing to remember. Uh, so all histories are lumped into the same equivalence class. Okay, so you don't actually need to do much or anything in this case to predict if you know the the generative model. Okay, well, maybe if we had some history dependence, so people talk about Markovian models. Here's a very simple example of the Markovian model, golden mean process. What happens after one time step? Well, it's Markovian. Once you've seen something, then that's the only thing you need to condition on and you know the future. So it's just one time step ephemeral collapse of your information and you're synchronized. Okay, um, I'll just point out, I guess, given this audience that this is maybe relevant for if we're thinking about certain tasks that we usually give to benchmark transformers, whatever it is. Uh, you know, we'll give things like the board game Othello, and then it's like, hey, look, this thing is linearly represented there. How does that jive with our predictions of all these, you know, crazy histories that you need to remember? Well, board games are. Uh, typically Markovian, I don't know that much about Othello to be honest, but like board games in general um, are Markovian. If you see the state of the board, that is everything. Uh, there's nothing hidden. So, so maybe if you just have a sequence of moves, you would need to build up the board state. Um, but um, board games are examples of Markovian processes. And so things like that should be linearly represented even according to computational mechanics. Um, but then again, for these non-Markovian processes, which is important for us to keep in mind, especially for natural language and the sort of data that we're training on, um, that's not it. So a little more generally, you're going to have some finite Markov order, in which case you'll have some number of time steps. So you'll see in in green on the right, I'm, I'm plotting um, these, these belief states, distinguishing them from the kind of blue, purple, whatever it is, uh, from these recurrent states. And so if you have a finite Markov order, then after a finite number of steps, uh, you'll you'll synchronize. So you, it, you only need to look a certain distance into the past if there's a finite Markov order. But this is really isn't the general case. In general, even if you had a two-state uh, hidden Markov model, uh, you could be stuck in transient belief states forever. You could rattle around here forever, although with exponentially decaying probability. OK, but that's also not as rich as it gets. Um, the thing I showed you before was a, a unifeeler model. And here, if we had a non-unifeeler source, well, you have you can have infinitely many transients that you can be stuck in forever. And there can be infinitely many recurrent uh, states. Um, recall, again, that the recurrent belief structure, actually, the whole belief structure has to be, has to be unifeeler. So generically, when you have non-unifeeler hidden Markov models, which is just a generic hidden Markov model, you're going to have some infinite predictive structure. So it gives maybe some hint where the, the fractal is coming from. And this finite structure of the source tells you how you fold probabilities uh, according to Bayes' rule, right? And then just as a final example of this, uh, I don't want to um, belabor things too much, but um, it's also important to keep in mind that not everything comes from a single well-connected component. So even in the case when you just have two different components, like that is your process, uh, every sequence is sampled from, let's say, one of these coins, but more generally, you can have sequences sampled from different processes, and maybe that's your, your corpus of data. We have different languages, genres, there's a whole hierarchy of things. 
in these cases, the predictive model uh, really gets interesting structure. Even in the, this very simple case, you get this, this interesting lattice structure. And um, I, I think I saw it, that someone was um, already talking about looking at these um, non-ergodic processes. And, and there's a lot to do there, especially in terms of how models will synchronize to us. Because again, that's the point that when we train transformers or whatever uh, models of next token prediction, once they've learned, they will be synchronizing to you. And um, not only to which state, but also to which component. So that plays together in a really interesting way. All right. So yeah, yeah, I've talked about, there's these belief states. We've, we've seen them there, uh, which is great. We have some idea of the representations. We can maybe back out world models, but what else can we predict is um, something about behavior. So uh, I quickly introduced this myopic entropy rate that remember it's the entropy of the next token given some uh, history of length L. And what this mixed state presentation, one of the things that it does for us is it helps us to understand, and in the case of toy models, quantify um, analytically uh, how a model would um, would synchronize to us, how it would become less certain as it synchronizes to us in context. So um, the basically the eigenmodes of decay here are going to be in terms of uh, the eigenvalues of the transition matrix, not of the generative model, but of the whole mixed state metadynamic. So if you can think of this whole uh, transition structure of the beliefs, um, it's the spectral character of that um, that tells you about the convergent structure. And for natural language, because you have these uh, non-ergodic structures, that's generically going to be a, a power law. So um, just a flashback to where we started. Hopefully this makes a little more sense, or maybe it already did, but it gave some useful background. Um, and I think with that, I've gone on for a while. So um, you guys have heard that we've started this uh, research initiative, Synflex. Um, we're really excited to uh, see where this goes. We're really excited for you guys to, to join us in the hackathon to uh, push the boundaries of knowledge. And, um, you know, feel free to consult our uh, recent archive paper, which has more details. Um, if you want a little more of the theory background, I put a paper here of mine that maybe is useful. And also Adam and I will um, be around at least for the weekend to, to answer some, some questions. Um, so with that, um, Adam, do you want to take it away? Unless there's yeah. any questions. <clears throat> there's... There is one question in the chat that maybe you can take while I um, put up my slides. Sure. Um, right, so so what makes transient states transient in the mixed state presentation? Uh, you can get stuck there forever, yes. Um, so, so I'll just keep up the slides for a second so I can uh, show this. So, um, right, so there's kind of uh, a few ways in which you can get stuck forever that um, basically you could rattle around in transients forever, but in like in, in these cases where you have a finite state hidden Markov model that represents the, the belief dynamic, um, it will essentially be uh, some, a sum of exponential decays, polynomial time exponential, but um, you can have particular um, contexts in which you, you're not synchronized as, as well as possible. Um, and, uh, but, but you could also basically make arbitrarily difficult structures. You could imagine doing this where you, um, you know, especially if you have some, some interesting logical structure that you need to synchronize to. Um, I, I think that'd be an interesting thing to explore also, um, maybe as the belief state structure becomes maybe larger in some sense than the residual stream. How does the model deal with that? Um, we've usually been looking in the case when you know you have to project down to the belief state structure, um, but it would be interesting to look at when when actually there's a bottleneck. Rather, um, what happens there? I think that'd be make a pretty good project. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing here, um, and. Let's see, Zmobli is asking if there's been any CompMec result involving, uh, I guess, adversarial networks. And um, maybe you can tell me more about that. I guess my understanding is that that would be more of 
a generative model effectively rather than a predictive model, um, in which case there's there are some results about minimal generative models. Um, but would, as far as I understand GANs, um, would have less to do with the predictive structure. But um, maybe, uh, you know, feel, feel free to help me to understand the connection. I'd actually like to understand that better. Um, can you see my slides? I can. Okay, cool. I'm going to assume everyone can, unless uh, someone says otherwise. So yeah, I, I don't think there's been any comment results involving actual GANs. Um, that'd be very cool. I think, yeah, I don't know enough about GANs to say for sure that I would expect them to have a generative and not a predictive structure, but that certainly sounds plausible given that they're called GANs. Um, it'd be super cool if that were the case. And certainly something to look at. Um, so yeah, like, like um, Paul just showed us, I think in kind of pretty concrete terms, um, Tom kind of gives us a quite principled definition of what structure means that can be applied to the training data, that can be applied to the computation that the network itself is, is performing and the behavior of the model itself. Um, and because of this, we, we're excited that it can kind of act as a conduit between what is usually studied by MechInterp, which is kind of the mechanism and the internal structures and focusing on attention patterns and, and stuff like that, and kind of the model behavior. It's kind of in this middle realm where the predictive structure is not necessarily the features or the, or the mechanism, and it's not necessarily the behavior itself, right? It's not the next token prediction structure. It's this in-between thing that can act as kind of a, a really nice communication channel between the two and make sense of both of them in their relationship. So, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through the code base um, that will be available to all of you, it already is, and then I'll go through some project ideas. So these are definitely not all of the possible project ideas. They're just kind of some inspiration for things that could be done during the hackathon. Um, and another thing I want to emphasize is that uh, we really care that um, everything, that this kind of goes smoothly for people and that people can contribute. So if at any time anything is, um, if you feel stuck or you're unsure about something, you don't know what to do next, please uh, reach out. Um, so yeah. So the code base, and these slides are available on the resources page of the Hackathon website. So I, I made it so that you can kind of click on things and look back on it. Um, so the code base has a few features that will be useful for doing uh, interpretability work with CompMec. Um, in particular, we can define, define these data markup models, these data generating processes, compute the mixed state presentations, compute a few of these information theoretic CompMec properties that um, Paul was talking about. And then we have a bunch of example notebooks for analysis that I'll just I won't go into detail, but I'll show you kind of the features. Um, so we can define data generating process, processes, and there's a bunch of them that are already predefined in the code base, uh, the random random mixer process, the method three process, a few of the other processes that Paul mentioned. Um, and you can also add your own processes. It's very, you just import the process and you instantiate it. And then the process object itself has transition matrices. And then you can use functions available in, in the code base um, to visualize the process. Um, so yeah, here's the actual code that you can refer to that, um, that will allow you to yeah, instantiate these different processes. And you can even add your own to the library. I'd be happy if people added interesting processes and we can actually uh, merge that into the main uh, code base, that'd be cool. Um, and then we can also, once you have a process, we can use the code base to make the mixed state presentation. And the way that this actually works kind of in the background is that first you create a tree structure, which we call the mixed state tree. And this tree structure um, kind of starts uh, with an initial belief state. The nodes are belief states. And then every time you get a new token, uh, you go to a new belief state. So you just have this long tree structure of all the possible different token sequences you can have and how that changes your belief state. And then 
you can take that tree and you can look through it to see which of the nodes are actually the same and then kind of combine them into one thing. And that gives you a transition matrix, which is a new hidden Markov model. Um, and then you can actually use this transition matrix process to define a new process, which is the mixed state presentation. Um, so this is the way that we can make a new presentation. This is how you get this kind of metadynamics. And then we can use all the same functions to, to um, visualize it like before. As, as Paul mentioned, this example here is a random random XOR. And it has 36 distinct belief states. And that's what you see here. Um, and then from the mixed state tree object, you can actually compute a bunch of very useful things for doing experiments and analysis. You can get all of the possible sequences, which we're calling paths. So every path through the tree is a sequence. And then every node is a belief. So you can get all of the paths and all of the beliefs. So in this case, um, just printing out a few of the paths that you get from the random random XOR process, you see the each sequences that the random random XOR process can generate and the corresponding belief that you have over those five um, hidden states that generate that data. And then another thing you can do once you have the mixed state presentation is actually a highly efficient structure for computing some of these information theoretic properties. So for instance, the myopic entropy rate, um, which is how kind of your entropy decreases as you see longer and longer time scales of data, um, that's kind of, you get that, that's a property of this mixed state tree that you can compute on the fly and plot. Um, so then once we have all of those tools, it's actually quite straightforward. I'm not showing all of the data here, but I'm showing you kind of the logic. The logic is quite straightforward and easy to actually implement. Um, to implement um, kind of what we did in, in the blog post and in our work. So finding this fractal and the transformer. The first thing you do is define a process, then you compute the mixed state presentation. You enumerate all of the possible token sequences that this process can generate. And then, um, and then we get the ground truth beliefs uh, by looking at all the nodes in the, in the tree structure. Then we run all of those sequences through a transformer. And um, in the code base that we're using, we're using uh, transformer lens, which is very useful. And there's a lot of stuff in the mechanter side of things that uses transformer lens that can be brought in through this, which is nice. We can get all the activations. And then we basically just do linear regression between the activations and the ground truth beliefs. Um, and then we can plot a result. So, um, so this is the result here. So what is the depth argument? Yeah, yeah. so the depth argument, this is a good question. The depth argument is how deep we're going in the tree. So um, in practice, that's how long uh, of sequences we're considering. And so the reason this is relevant for transformers is because there's a finite context window. So uh, in the experiments, for all of the experiments that are available to you, so there's data from a bunch of experiments available to you, I use the context window of 10. The reason why I do depth 11 instead of 10 is because we need one more, um, because when you train when you train the transformer on that 10th token, you need the 11th token to know, to compute the loss for that one. So I actually compute it with 11, and then I chop it at 10 to get the inputs, but then I need to go one after that to get the, um, what we're trying to train to, if that makes sense. So that's what the depth argument is. Um, hopefully that made sense. Um, so I'll go through some project ideas right now, um, relatively quickly. Uh, for any of these, extremely excited to go into more depth kind of uh, in the Discord, um, but I just kind of wanted to give a feel for the different types of things that are available. Um, so the first thing, um, so like in the blog post and in our work, we kind of, as Paul was saying, we were looking at the mixed state, the mixed, the belief state geometry, the simplex structure is like quite static. But in reality, the mixed state presentation is a dynamic hypothesis that has kind of causality built into it because it says for any, for any particular belief state that you're in, 
and a token that you get, you should change your belief state in a particular way. And so what that means is that if I'm at one particular belief state, but I for if the network's in one particular belief state, and I force the network to be in another one, and then I get a, a new token, I have a hypothesis for that, how that should change the output, both in terms of the internal representations and, and the behavior in terms of the next token prediction. Um, so this is a causal hypothesis beyond just kind of a representation hypothesis. Um, so we haven't done any work so far doing a kind of testing that the causality is actually implemented in the, in the transformer. Um, so that's available to do and would be very cool. Um, another thing you can do is kind of bring to bear any of the mechinterp uh, tools um, that exist. Um, so this is just to show kind of some things I've been looking at recently. Uh, so in, in the work that we've, we've shown publicly, we've mostly been looking at kind of the last layer of the residual stream and finding the fractal structure. But you can do that um, both over training, but also over the different layers and the different parts of the transformer. So this is um, a slightly different setting of the hyperparameters for this three-state generative process that produces a fractal structure in its mixed state presentation. Um, and then if you kind of zoom in, you can actually see kind of the details of how the residual stream and the attention build up this fractal. It creates a triangle. And then when you add back into the residual stream, um, it kind of adds back to the embedding, which is three points in the triangle. So you get three triangles. Uh, and then the MLP stretches it out and so on and so forth. You can kind of follow it step by step. So there's um, a lot of things to do probably in the mechanturf world. Another kind of idea that I had just kind of thinking about the ways mechanturf could be brought to bear here is that as Paul was saying, you could think of these nodes in the mixed state presentation as groups of histories that constrain the uh, future in similar ways. And so the only place that a transformer can actually bring information from the past to bear on a future prediction is through the attention head, through the attention mechanism. So we should be able to look at the attention patterns to see exactly how information is moving from the past to the future. And we can ask questions like, given what we know from the mixed state presentation about kind of what the most efficient way to move information from the past to the future is, what can we see this being brought kind of being done in the attention mechanism, mechanism itself. Um, so kind of looking at attention patterns can kind of get you there. That's another kind of mechanistic understanding of um, how these transformers are carrying out the mixed state presentation. Another thing that's been mentioned has been non-ergodic processes. Um, and um, this is maybe relevant to in context learning. It's certainly relevant in general to language because we in our training data for these uh, large, for real large language models, um, they have source data from many different places. So for instance, Wikipedia, 4chan, and addition mod 113. These are obviously not the actual data generating structures, but um, one could imagine studying non-ergodic sets like this um, and understanding how the mixed state presentations kind of relate to each other. Um, in how they sit in the residual stream and what the implications of those relations are to kind of the behavior of of the um, of the transformer. Another thing to do, and Gans were already mentioned, this is kind of a similar type idea. You can you can top mech is quite general, and the theory says nothing about the specifics of the transformer. It's really just about sequential data. Um, and sequential processes. And so RNNs um, are a, a different architecture where we could expect the same thing, except instead of the residual stream, now you're just kind of in the hidden set of the RNN and at every time point you're updating that. So the question could be, can we find the belief state representation in that hidden stream um, that's being updated? Um, so we would expect that to happen, but we haven't done the experiments yet. And finding that, are, that it would uh, apply to RNNs would be quite cool because that means that our results are not, they're general in that they, they don't require the specifics of a transformer neural network to apply. Um, 
I see a question. Um, Nine ergodic because if you were predicting with him. Yeah, that's why that's why it's non ergodic. Yeah. So like this isn't exactly right, but if you just think of kind of individual sources and then kind of putting them next to each other, that will give you a non ergodic process. Yeah, multiple disconnected components, exactly. Um so another thing I find extremely exciting. Um, and this kind of even goes beyond just AI and like even towards kind of cognitive science is kind of trying to answer questions using this framework that that gets you kind of fundamentally what are different types of cognitive capacities. Um, and we can, so for instance, abstraction is one of these capacities that transformers seem to be able to have in some way, but what exactly is that? Um, in a similar way to, you know, oftentimes we talk about world models and have debates about world models, but what really is that? Um, and so we're, I'm trying to come up with an experiment here that has to do with abstraction, um, which I, I think of as like a particular type of cognitive capacity. Um, that's like, you could see it as an example of like, um, when you ask a transform, you ask ChatGPT to give you uh, a poem in a, an old dead language, but about the internet, and it can do it. Uh, it's taking kind of the abstract structure of this dead language and applying it to kind of novel data. And how is it able to take those two structures and put them together? Um, so I think using a formalism, we can get start getting to that kind of thing. And so one kind of simple idea is, if I take the zero one random process and I replace the zeros and the ones with A and B, or I replace it with X and Y, and I put them together next to each other as a non-ergodic process, we can ask the question, what would it mean for a transformer to kind of understand that these two processes have shared structure? Um, for, each of these, uh, for each of these components, we expect there to be a simplex structure rep represented in a 2D plane um, in the transformer. And then they can kind of be an orthogonal sub uh, planes or they can maybe align more. And if they align more, um, that kind of feels like it's understood that kind of an X is the same as an A. So it's kind of, it's generalized out, it's abstracted away. And then behaviorally, what that would mean is that it's able to take uh, combinations of, of context windows that contain both X, Ys, As, and Bs and still predict optimally the next token. Um, so this is kind of a setting where we can study kind of the mechanistic and behavioral underpinnings of abstraction. Another one, um, as Paul mentioned, the way that you get from one belief state to the next, um, given that you've seen another token, is by Bayes' rule. This is like literally Bayes' rule where your belief state at a given time point is the prior. Um, the transition matrices def define how, um, define a likelihood, and then using those two things, you get um, you get a posterior, which is your next belief state. And so finding finding the belief state geometry kind of hints that maybe a Bayesian updating thing is going on in the transformer. Well, we have the explicit equation for the Bayesian updating rule. Um, can we find the implementation of that formula inside of the transformer? Um, so that's that. And then we can even go back and start to think about other kind of interpretability work and try to try to understand it from, from this new perspective. So for instance, with modular addition and grokking, the training data of modular addition has a particular structure that can be represented as, an, as a hidden Markov model. Um, that's not kind of usually what people do, but it can be done. Uh, that hidden Markov model has a mixed state presentation and the bully state geometry associated with it. Um, and then not just the training data, but the full data set also has a, a different HMM with a different MSP. And then we can ask questions about what is the relationship between the two MSPs? What do each of the MSPs look like? Um, if we consider those mixed state presentation structures, is there anything that kind of like jumps out that looks, can we explain why we, ex we expect kind of 4A modes and things like that? 
Um, my guess is yes, but obviously this hasn't been done. And then another thing that I'd be very excited to see happen is kind of this difference between sequential and algorithmic tasks, um, because I think this kind of gets at the heart of one of the things that's a little bit different from the comic perspective, which is that it really puts the sequential nature of language kind of heart and center of the thinking. Um, whereas a lot of the times with things like modular addition or Boolean circuits, it's much more algorithmic in, in its conception. So um, one, one way you can operationalize this distinction is, um, you know, with, with the modular addition work, for instance, the, you're always putting the first digit kind of in the same context window position, the second digit in the next context window position and the answer in the last context window position. And so it's not obvious what that means in terms of this kind of synchronization story, uh, because you kind of, because you're, you kind of for free, maybe the transformer gets to know what state the data generating structure is in. So an equivalent to that with the random rex, random XOR process would be to compare cases where you train a transformer always starting um, in this particular initial state um, versus ones where you don't always start in that particular initial state and see if you still get the uh, belief state structure in both of them. Is there some relation? Um, you know, what are the implications kind of at large for Mechans Airport? I, I actually, I'm, confused about this, which is why I'm so excited about um, this type of project. Um, so I'll stop there for now with ideas. There's more ideas in the open problems and we can also discuss, and we'll discuss, I think in about half an hour um, in the Discord, if you wanna go there, um, we can discuss ideas and, and start getting groups together. Um, so yeah, I, I listed a bunch of other resources. Um, most of them you can find on, I think all of them you can find on the Hackathon resource page. Uh, so yeah. Let's see. And, let's see, Adam, uh, there's some question on the two different HMMs. I answered a little bit in chat. Um, I'm not sure if that clarified it. And also, uh, Zmobly had a question on kind of more specific of, I guess, what's being looked for in terms of hackathon output, if you want to address that. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I would, that's a good question. So, so Paul and I will be judging these. Um, I guess, maybe I should have thought about this more concretely and made a rubric, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing yeah, any of those things are fine. I guess like at, at the end of the day, what I'd be considering is that, um, you know, actual progress has been made. Um, so I think there's always this kind of gamble with more exploratory stuff in that you don't know that you'll get anything useful. At the same time, that's kind of such early stages in applying CompMech that, for instance, like the stuff that I did looking at the different layers and overtraining, that's quite exploratory, but actually you get some cool stuff out of it very easily. Um, so basically any of these things, I'd be quite happy. And well, we'll distinguish kind of a winning thing from a not winning project um, will be basically the extent that you're able to um, create something new and intriguing. Uh, which is not the most rigid structure, but uh, that's what's coming to me right now, if that makes sense. Yeah, and if you want to make, and hopefully, like, um, you should have fun with this, right? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess part of the kind of result for, for picking winners is like, we should be impressed. But um, I think a good way to, like make us impressed is to have fun and do something cool, <laughs> you know, um, because in, in any case, I think, I think that's an important part of the process is just like playing with this stuff. Um, you know, a little competition can be, can be fun, but, um, but I really hope that, that everyone can have a good time with it. Yeah. Um, so I think with that, 
I'll I'll end this and then um, I'll take a little break. Thanks to everyone for coming. I'll I'll take a little break and then uh, meet everyone back in the Discord. I'll be there probably in like ten minutes. Um, but I think officially, it doesn't start for another half hour. This kind of um, yeah discussion and brainstorming and creating teams. So yeah, see everyone there. Thanks.